thank you for the honor of this keynote. My keynote is going to be on articular cartilage restoration and what do I really do in 2023. We know that articular cartilage is extremely important for all of us knee surgeons because it provides a low friction bearing surface that enables equal distribution of loads across the joint. And this minimizes the peak stresses on subchondral bone and therefore it's critical. We also know that the capacity of articular cartilage to heal on its own is limited. And most full thickness tears and defects of the articular cartilage will progress to more widespread degeneration. And in fact, 50% of patients will develop some grade of osteoarthritis over a 14 year follow up. Recognizing this, surgeons have opted for many options. So what would happen if we were to do nothing? So take this patient of mine, for example, this is a medial femoral condyle condyle injury. It's a full thickness condyle injury. It's and He's a distance runner, he's middle-aged, and he has mild varus. He opted not to do anything for this, and he continued running. So this is at three weeks. At three months, you can see that that defect has large, is now larger in size. It's a little more widespread. Despite this, he continues running, and at six months, he's got bone edema there, and uh, he still persists. Five years down the line, He's already got arthritic changes with a small osteophyte coming in there. And seven years down the line, this is medial compartment OA. So a small defect which would progressively worsen in someone who has mild varus and who does not uh, decrease his loads on the knee. So untreated lesions usually have a very poor outcome. Recognizing this, over the years, we've had numerous surgeries uh, uh, proposed, right from uh, fixations of OCDs, microfracture, uh, oats and mosaic plasty, synthetic uh, uh, plugs, uh, allografts, uh, ACI, and uh, some limited uh, uh, resurfacing prosthesis also. So why, is, why does all of this fit in in my algorithm in 2023? So if I've got a knee articular cartilage defect and it's a traumatic osteochondral fracture, this is the one that I'm going to fix. And this would usually be either an open or an arthroscopic reduction with fixation. So take this patient, for example, this is a adolescent child who's got an intra-articular osteochondral fracture of the lateral femoral condyle, well noted there on the X-ray and the MRI. This for me is an indication for repair, fixation. So I do an arthroscopy, assess that fragment, this fragment we know from the imaging itself is large enough for a fixation. I will reconfirm that on that arthroscopy. Look at the bone because most of that healing is going to take place with that subchondral bone. As soon as I've identified that that fragment does have good subchondral bone, that fragment comes out. This free fragment is then going to be fixed. I'm going to do a mini open because I think it's extremely difficult to get anatomical reduction with an arthroscopic one, especially the rotational part. So mini open and fix it there either with titanium Herbert screws, which are countersunk or bioabsorbable countersunk screws. And I think that this is a very reproducible way to ensure that you've got good cartilage healing because this is traumatic. And on the CT scan, you can note that that's healed really well within three months itself. On the other hand, if this was not an acute fracture and he comes to you late, then can we fix these? And that was the question that we asked ourselves. And so we did a small study where we took out osteochondral fragments and tried to see if the chondrocytes were viable. And what we noted was that in these chronic intra-articular loose osteochondral fragments, up to three months, if the macroscopic sort of view of the articular cartilage was good, then they did retain chondrocyte viability. They were capable of culture and cell multiplication. And we use that primarily to know whether we can get ACI culture from these fragments, but then we extrapolated that for fixations too. And so you can see in this patient who's presented to us late, this is an intra-articular osteochondral lateral femoral condyle fracture, which is three months old. This fragment's been there in the synovial fluid out there for three months, three months down the line, we get it out, turn him prone, fix it there with countersunk Herbert screws, and this is healed, and that's his five-year follow-up. So even if it's chronic, if that articular cartilage looks good, even at three months in the post-traumatic ones, I think you can repair it. If this is a OCD, and that means it would be an ICRS OCD4 with a displaced fragment, I think you should not be repairing and fixing these. 
Now, what about partial thickness articular cartilage defects? I would normally go ahead and do a chondroplasty. A lot of these don't require surgery, but if he's got a flap that's catching or locking his knee, then I think all you need to do is, with your shaver, just very simply take that flap off. Don't be too aggressive. Uh, some surgeons prefer to do this with radio frequency. Yes, you could, but don't cause any further trauma. Just stabilize the edges. What if it's a full thickness grade 4 chondral or osteochondral defect? We've got so many options out there, and which one should you be using? Well, the first and the, the classical option that's been there since many, many years has been marrow stimulation. So in marrow stimulation, what do you do? You've got all of these flaps. You excise those flaps. Make sure that you've taken out all of the surrounding unhealthy cartilage so you get good surrounding walls, and then you make puncture holes. How many puncture holes should you make? Well, initially we used to make puncture holes every three millimeters apart so that you could get your super clot in, but now it's believed you don't really need more than three or four because you will get that super clot through just one or two and you don't want to destabilize the subchondral plate. Now, this is a very easy technique and all of you who don't have access to other techniques at least do a microfracture. Unfortunately, a microfracture is very unpredictable. And what we found is there'll be some patients who will do extremely well, especially the smaller defects, but there are many others who would not do well. And so we've had a range of post-operative MOCART scores, which is really MRI evaluation of cartilage repair, where scores have been as low as 30 and as high as 95. So extremely unpredictable. If you want to put art, uh, Highline cartilage, because a microfracture is going to result in fibrocartilage. If you really want to put in highline cartilage, then I think this is my technique of choice. This would be a mosaic plasty or an osteochondral autograph transfer. So what do you do? You take pegs from a so-called unimportant area of the femoral trochlea above the sulcus terminalis, and then this osteochondral peg is then implanted, press fit into the area of the defect. And typically, we found very, very good results for focal defects. So this defect needs to really be of a size less than two centimeters. Because if you take out more than two pegs, there's a significant risk of donor morbidity in the patellofemoral joint. So the technique is relatively simple. Arthroscopically, you assess your defect, see the size that you need to put. You take two pegs from the area of the lateral femoral condyle for a medial condyle defect. Those pegs are then implanted press fit. And to do this, you need to make sure that you're absolutely perpendicular when you make your sockets. Size them, use the dilator, and then press fit those pegs in there. When you put these pegs in, they need to be uh, congruous. And, they need to make, and you need to make sure that they're not proud, because if they're proud, they can catch. If they're a bit depressed, I think it'd be okay. But the real difficulty here is getting your three-dimensional congruity. And uh, if you do that, you're going to get a great result. So take this patient, for example, this medial femoral condyle mosaic plasty at six months. I've used two pegs, eight and six. And you can see that that's good restoration there. And at the six-month follow-up, this bone is healing. And at the two-year follow-up, this is completely healed. Subchondral bone is normal. The articular cartilage is normal. And if you were to do a T2 cartilage scan on these, a cartigram, you'll find that highline cartilage is as normal as anywhere else. So I think well done. Small defects do well. But mosaic plasty has numerous problems. The question of availability of grafts, you can't really do anything larger than two centimeters. What happens at the donor sites? You're going to get fibrocartilage there. There's a technical difficulty of getting the three dimensional restoration. So I think it's difficult and multiple concerns. And therefore, for larger lesions, we moved on to autologous chondrocyte implantation. So in autologous chondrocyte implantation, what we have available to us in India is the gel-based ACI. You take a biopsy of the cartilage, grow it in the lab, and then implant it. So for difficult areas where you really can't get restoration, this is, I think, a good option, like this patella defect we've gone ahead and done an aci and you'll note here that you can reconstruct the shape and so the central ridge which is so difficult to get with any technique you can do that with your aci what's the role of 
allografts today, we do get allografts, but they're extremely expensive. We have to import them in most circumstances. And so allografts are reserved for absolutely the cases where I can't do anything else. So like this patient, this patient had a medial femoral condyle AVN that was operated, which failed. So now this patient's got a huge osteochondral defect there in that medial femoral condyle. The only way you can reconstruct this whole sectoral defect is with an osteochondral allograft. And you can see there on that MRI, you can get great healing of the subchondral bone, and you can also get good restoration of the hyaline cartilage. And when we did a second look arthroscopy on this patient 24 months down the line, you'll note that that articular cartilage is healthy, and you really can't make out the difference between normal cartilage and articular cartilage. And you also have good interface healing, which often you don't get in many other techniques. So all in all, for a full thickness defect, if I've got a very small lesion of less than 5 millimeters, I'll go for a bone marrow stimulation. If I've got anything between 5 to 20, and I think most of our cases fall into this, I would go for a mosaic plasty or an osteochondral autograph transfer. If it's anything more than 20 millimeters, I know I'm going to have donor site morbidity, so I'll go for an autologous chondrocyte implantation. Any really large lesion beyond five centimeters or a sectoral osteochondral defect where I need to get the shape of that condyle in, the only way I can do that is with an osteochondral allograft. And for bipolar lesions, which are more or less degenerative, I'm going to do just a bone marrow stimulation because not the other, uh, previous techniques are going to be so successful. Now, whenever we do a cartilage repair, I think it's really important that we correct the predisposing factors. Don't forget that. So if there's a malalignment, there's a maltracking of the patellofemoral joint, or if there's a ligament instability, then I think it's absolutely uh, imperative that we take care of that. Otherwise, your cartilage repair is going to fail. Take, for example, this patient, which I did 15 years back. This is a medial femoral condyle OCD with a varus malalignment. And you can see that this patient has this huge medial femoral condyle defect. So we did a fibrin ACI with bone grafting. So we bone grafted it. On top of that, we did our fibrin ACI, but added uh, osteotomy to it. And that osteotomy, of course, has healed. And last year, when she came in for her 14-year follow-up, it wasn't for the operated left knee. It was for her right knee, which was giving her symptoms. So I think that that osteotomy really helped this patient uh, uh, 14 years back. The last... Uh, sort of option that we've got since the last uh, year or so is for focal degenerative defects. So where's the role of that? So if I have a patient with a focal degenerative defect, in the past we used to just do a debridement, but I think today you do have the option in India of doing an epicelar. It's a focal surface replacement. So take this patient, for example. This is a 52-year-old male. He's had a prior uh, surgery for a tumor in the thigh and has landed up with this lymphedema in this limb and he's got this painful defect of the articular cartilage here. He's also got a meniscus tear with it. Now his x-rays are relatively okay, his alignment is normal and typically in these scenarios we used to offer them just the meniscectomy and the debridement but today you can actually change just that part and this is a patient specific implant that would be made. So we did the mapping, uh, got the implant made, went in for that arthroscopy. So that's his degenerative tear there. So of course, we've gone ahead and done a meniscectomy there for that degenerative tear. This is not a tear that's amenable to any sort of repair. So once we've done a meniscectomy there, we've stabilized the edges, then we address the chondral defect. In the, and you'll note that when you look at this chondral defect, it looks relatively small and you think, could you just get away with the microfracture? But when you start seeing the MRI and the edges, you'll note that there's quite a large zone of degenerate cartilage there. And for these patients, you'd go ahead and do an open approach. You get these patient-specific jigs that are made because this is a patient-specific instrumentation. And with this, you'd create the socket which would uh, receive the implant. It's an extremely simple technique. Uh, and once you've done this, the only thing you really need to make sure that is that your implant is going to be half a millimeter to 0.9 millimeters depressed in the articular cartilage. So you can note that and we try and make sure that we're getting that depression there because you don't want to put it flush. When this patient weight bears, 
the articular cartilage is going to get compressed a bit. And if your implant is slight, is, is flush, that's going to be proud in the weight-bearing situation. So you want this to be uh, uh, submerged by about half a millimeter to 0.9 of a millimeter. And with this, this would be a good option for repair. So all in all, this is my algorithm in 2023 for articular cartilage defects. Traumatic fractures at fix up to three months. For the cartilage defects that are partial thickness, just a chondroplasty. For the full thickness defects, correct the predisposing factors and then treat it based on size, site, and patient profile. And for the focal degenerative defects, I'm going to do a patient-specific small surface implant. <clears throat> Hunter in 1743 said that from Hippocrates to the present age, it's universally allowed that ulcerated cartilage is a troublesome thing and that when destroyed, it is not recovered. I think that's been valid for uh, centuries. But I think that in today's day age, we're just about with mosaic plasty and oats, with ACI and with allografts, just about changing the scenario with cartilage repair. And I think that we are just about seeing good results. Thank you.